I confess to you a series of felonies about which only three people have ever known. Truth be told, my active career as a felon was 30 years ago and ridiculously short-lived. <laughs> However, in this single three-hour crime spree I'm about to cop to, I did manage to pack in one count each of felonious vandalism, consp conspiracy to commit fraud, and grand theft auto. So, it's 1987, I'm 26. I get a phone call, quite late. My older brother, Tom, in hushed tones, tells me that he has to see me right away, no questions asked, <laughs> because he has done something really stupid. <laughs> That's all he'll say. No questions on the phone, face to face, really stupid. <laughs> I agreed. No questions asked. Well, if that sounds stupid to you, I'll observe that older siblings exercise lifelong powers over younger siblings. <laughs> that toll doubles in dysfunctional family zones. <laughs> when you survive certain experiences together, it bonds you in ways that blood alone does not. It's a shared survival mechanism. Back in my brother's play is how I thought of it in my 20s. Of course, the clinical term for it is, anyone? Codependency, yes. <laughs> As I pull up in my 1969 Mustang, Tom comes out of his apartment. A handsome man, my brother, 30 at the time, six foot four, charming, self-assured. He sidles up to the vehicle, eases himself into the front passenger seat, and repeats, I've done something really stupid. <laughs> uh, Dylan, the boy's okay? I ask, just a little nervous. The last time he'd called me down late and urgent, Tom and I had gone for a cool down walk around the block while the neighbors called the cops on a domestic dispute. But he seemed calm. Now I'm thinking, oh geez, another woman. But no, it turns out that the stupid thing my brother had done was neither assault and battery nor serial infidelity, but to lease a vehicle. <laughs> a 1987 silver Ford Taurus on unfavorable terms. He compounded this error by letting his girlfriend drive the car on occasions which coincided with her manic phases, to which he attributed a good deal of the damage to the tires and fender. The time had come to renew the lease or return the vehicle Monday morning, but either way, pay the $500 deductible for the damage done to the 1987 Silver Ford Taurus. With unsteady employment, an unstable girlfriend, and two kids to support, Tom could ill afford $500. And here it was, Thursday tight place. You can see that. When you need a brother's help. So we sit in my 1969 Mustang and plot the fake theft of the 1987 Silver <laughs> Ford Taurus. <laughs> my brother's plan calls for me to come down the next night, take the extra key he had made on the sly, perhaps a fourth felony, that key said do not copy, Use this illicitly copied key to unlock his car, then drive east for a couple of hours and crash the car in a steep arroyo somewhere in Anza Borrego Desert. <laughs> Tom is to report the vehicle stolen over the weekend, and either the wreck would never be found or the damage will be so total as to void the lease's $500 deductible. There was a flaw in Tom's plan, <laughs> of course. He had, in older sibling fashion, neglected to make any provision for my return from the desert. <laughs> I needed a co-conspirator. But who might go along with such a scheme? Jim Gerald was my closest friend. Since college, which neither of us had graduated, Jim looked like either Jesus or Satan, depending on who was describing his long hair, wispy beard, and the we weird light in his eyes. Jim was universally accounted a bad influence on me. He smoked weed, pretty constantly, ditched class in college and ducked staff development days at the elementary school we worked at to go grab a beer at a local bar. <laughs> but the truth is, for good or ill, Jim and I enabled each other. He was my rock-solid friend, the friend who climbed out of a warm and I'm quite sure shared bed to come fetch me in some parking lot at 3 a.m. when my car wouldn't start, the friend who scrabbled down the embankment to find me when I walked straight off the edge of Stonewall Peak in a blinding snow and then got me down the mountain, half-blinded, dribbling blood, 
and drove me an hour and a half to the closest ER. Then made me laugh for days afterwards, making fun of my swollen, sutured face, making me laugh until it hurt. The friend who swore he'd drive me across the border if the cops were ever after me on a bum murder rap <laughs> never breathe a word. Jim says, I'm in. So next night, Friday after work, he swings by my place and drives us in his beat-up little black Toyota pickup to the 1987 Silver Ford Taurus with the key taped under the driver's side door. <laughs> I disarm the car alarm, get in, and we drive east. Well, this was before cell phones and GPS, so Jim and I have to keep in visual contact. Cops pass us a couple of times as we're both driving well under the speed limit. Inside the cab of my brother's respectable 1987 Silver Ford Taurus, I chortle at law enforcement's obliviousness to our cunning criminal undertaking. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is, out past Alpine, any really significant precipice had guardrails to prevent exactly such a thing as an automobile plummeting into a canyon. <laughs> the places where there were no obstructions, the promontory is in plain view of the freeway for miles, and Either that or the precipice was too shallow for the car's complete destruction, which is essential. If simply banged up, rather than a complete crash and burn, the deductible kicks in. <laughs> so Jim and I keep driving. Three hours east, we pull off on a remote stretch of State Highway 98, which runs parallel to the international border, just over three kilometers north of it, and is only rarely visited by the Border Patrol. Just out of view of the highway, we come across a dirt turnoff to the south. It looks promising. We find a small abandoned quarry with a cliff-like rim at one end that would allow us to bail out and ditch the car at the last possible moment. <laughs> Jim stands by at the wheel of his pickup, the getaway car, as I position the sacrificial vehicle. Find a stone to weigh down the gas pedal, Jim calls out. But I decide against it. We want the insurance company to think the culprits took the car for a two-hour joyride to the desert and then crashed it on accident. And then, you know, walk back to the city. Or right. call their older brother to come and get them. No, I, I think safer to stand in the open door of the 1987 Silver Ford Taurus with my left foot on the running board, then rev the engine with my right foot on the gas pedal, accelerate, and at the last second, leap clear of the vehicle as it plunges off the top of the cliff to crash in the quarry below. Now, there's lots of ways that this plan could go wrong. <laughs> I see that now. But I didn't see that until I jumped clear of the car. As I lift myself out of the dust where I'd thrown myself, I'm hoping to catch the taillights as they vanish over the rim. So the sight of the 1987 Silver Ford Taurus struggling with the slight rise at the edge of the quarry is a surprise. But the car doesn't stall. It just teeters there for a moment, rocks backward, hesitates before the automatic transmission kicks in gear, and the car labels up the rise again. And again, the car approaches the verge, settles back, shifts gears. Each time, the steering wheel turning slowly, but ever so slightly, yet inexorably, to the right. When I realize that, the car's on its third approach. I start running pell-mell toward it, but too late. As before I could get to it, the 1987 Silver Ford Taurus steers itself clear of the rise and quarry altogether and aims itself across the flat brush land, headed <laughs> under the silver light of the full moon, rumbling in third gear, mowing down the chaparral. I'm afraid that's a fifth felony endangering native plant life kicking up a trail of chalky white dust that settles on me as I trail sadly after it toward the Mexican border, three kilometers away. When I turn around, Jim is balled up in the desert dust, laughing. <laughs> when I turn back, the tail lights of the 1987 Silver Ford Taurus have faded into the distance. Six hours after we left, we pull back into San Diego in Jim's little black pickup truck. It's a measure of his friendship that 
Jim doesn't try to talk on the drive back. <laughs> I call my brother, late, leaving a cryptic, unincriminating message on his answering machine. Saturday morning, he reports the car stolen, more or less successfully. Later that week, we learned that the valiant 1987 Silver Ford Taurus had made it more than two kilometers over rough terrain before succumbing just shy of the border. Body badly damaged, but chassis intact, thus incurring the $500 <laughs> deductible after all. So in the end, crime didn't pay. It, it just kind of broke even. Jim was the only witness to my criminal escapade. We never spoke about that night again. He never breathed a word of it to anyone, I'm quite sure. He died about two decades ago now. Heroin OD. I've held my tongue for 30 years. This is the first time I have spoken about that night that Jim and I boosted my brother's car together. I mean, 30 years, it's time. The statute of limitations ran out long ago, right? <laughs> I suppose I should have checked that first. <laughs> this is the first time I've written about my friend Jim. I am sorry it has taken me so long to get to this point. As much as we loved each other, Jim and I always abjured the modern hipster trend of denominating practically any close male friend as my brother. But Jim Gerald was as much a brother to me, you can see, as my own flesh and blood. As I said before, when you've survived certain experiences together, it bonds you in ways that blood alone cannot.